In your book, Girls and Sex, you talk a lot about changing perceptions and behaviors, expectations, mostly among girls today. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about kind of the, the struggle between the appearance of sexiness and experiencing pleasure, and just some of the issues that you've been exploring um, and learning from mm -hmm. talking to girls today and how things have changed. Well, well, that's a big way that things have changed. <laughs> and, you know, that, what, what brought me to that was that the book um, that I had done just previously was Cinderella Ate My Daughter. Mm -hmm. And that came out because I had a, a three-year-old at the time who had suddenly become into, you know, com suddenly was obsessed with princess culture or what I call the princess industrial complex. Um, and I thought, you know, ha when did this happen? How did this happen? And what worried me about that was that everything, not just the princess thing, but that was just kind of the launching point for me to look at the way that um, sexualization of girls had been aging downward, 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 mm -hmm. so that now the very youngest girls were being told from the get-go that how they looked was more important than how they felt or who they were, and that being desirable was more important than understanding their own desire. So it seemed kind of natural to go from that, especially as my own child was getting older, mm -hmm. um, to looking at what that meant about girls' sexual expression as they got older, and what that kind of innocent pink and pretty turns into is the imperative to be hot. Mm -hmm. And hot is not the same as beautiful, it's not the same as attractive, it's this very narrow, commercialized, commodified, and really unimaginative idea of what sexy is. Mm -hmm. And Ariel Levy, who wrote the book Female Chauvinist Pigs, can I swear? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Ariel Levy reduced, says hot can be defined by two words, by fuckable and sellable. Mm -hmm. that, that's a fusion of those two things. And what's confusing, I think, is that whereas our generation particularly our generation of feminists, particularly our, our generation of Oberlin feminists, yeah. would have pushed back against that. Um, now that idea is being sold to girls as self-empowerment, mm. as, as the ultimate form of self-empowerment. That is a big change. Yeah, and that is a, a huge change and something that, um, and it's a real bait and switch for them. And mm. it's something that we, you know, Argued, I argued a lot about with girls, but that they were really struggling with. This was supposed to be the way that they expressed their confidence, the way that they expressed empowerment. But there was this disconnect between that expression of sexiness mm -hmm. and their comfort and knowledge and you know feelings in their own bodies. Mm. And I love that you talk about um, you know it's what comes after consent right. also, and, right. and what is the experience for young women, and what are their expectations yeah. um, as a reciprocal relationship. Right, and that, you know, I mean, obviously, the conversation that we're having about sexual assault on campus, around mm -hmm. consent on campus, absolutely critical conversations, so important. But I really wanted to look at what happened after, yes, after mm -hmm. consent, because, you know, I felt like, frankly, I was not raped is a very low bar for a sexual experience, a very low bar. Yeah. So what's happening in their actual experience? Yeah. Well, we're here on a college campus, and I know that sexual assault and relationships is a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, but you have been talking to a lot of young women, and things have started much younger mm -hmm. now. So there are a lot of experiences that they bring to the college campus. Right. Um, so you've talked to a wide range of girls in their ages. But yeah, 15 to 20. And there's, yeah. it's really clear. And now I'm talking to boys, by the way. And yeah. uh, it's really clear to me that entering this conversation in college, while it's better than not entering it at all, um, is years too late. Mm -hmm. Years mm -hmm. too late. You know, so many of the girls that I spoke with had had um, experiences of, of assault in high school. Um, and certainly the hookup culture that we talk about in college, I think the reason that we talk about in college, on, obvious, uh, honestly, is because um, college students are all in one place and they're easy to study. And they're also easy, they're over 18, so you can get permission. Yeah. So that's why there's been so much focus, I think, on hookup culture in college. But the fact is, is that um, it's drifted down and it's pretty entrenched in high school. So if we're not talking to our kids about issues of reciprocity, sexual ethics, sexual pleasure, mm -hmm. um, as well as you know, risk and danger and all of that kind of stuff, um, 
then we're doing them a real disservice because they're coming to all of this. Even though they're not having, this, there's been a lot out on um, how statistically kids are having uh, intercourse less often, mm -hmm. they are engaging in other behaviors a lot more, particularly oral sex. Mm -hmm. And when we allow those behaviors to become not sex, then it opens up this whole opportunity for risk and lack of responsibility and lack of reciprocity. Yeah. I'm really thrilled to hear that you are talking to boys now as you know, I look at Girls and Sex, that great book that's doing very well. Uh, I have to say I kept thinking, and who's talking to the boys? Right, I know. Um, and how are we going to start sharing kind of a, a, a change in what they should expect in their relationship with, you know, with potential partners? So tell me a little bit about the research you're doing now and uh, how you're approaching boys, and is it different than the way you approach the book for girls? Yeah, it's been really, it's been unexpectedly um, easier, hmm. I, which, which surprised me. Um, I mean, what basically happened was I, people would say to me, you know, periodically, well, what about the boys? And I'd say, well, you know, that's really somebody else's work. I hmm. work with girls. I've been writing about girls for 20 years. And but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, okay, no, that's not right. I really have had half a conversation. Of course, I get to have two books out of it instead of one, so that's good. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But going back, it was interesting because I felt like people were like almost flinging boys at me. It was really a funny mm -hmm. thing, whereas it was not easy. And I don't know if it's because I'm a known quantity now or because people are more comfortable with the idea of boys being sexually active. Or if it's because, and I think this is definitely true, um, as little as we talk to girls, we talk to boys less, mm -hmm. and they have nobody to talk to. Yeah. And so I think what for me has been really interesting in talking to boys, I didn't know if they would talk to me. You know, I look like their mom. Um, maybe that would be a barrier. But while I think there's things they don't talk to me about, um, Mostly they don't, you, it's it's like language issues, mm -hmm. like the locker room banter issues. Yeah. Um, for everything they don't talk to me about, there's something that they are talking to me about that they have never told anybody before. And they mm -hmm. preface a lot with, I've never told anybody this before. And it's a lot about vulnerability and anxiety and fear and confusion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been it's been really If nobody else is talking to them, all they're getting then is from the media and from their friends. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah, and it's, it's hard. I mean, it's really, it's, it's talking to boys. It's been actually really um, touching my heart mm -hmm. much more than I kind of imagined it would to talk to boys because they're just, and they stay in touch in a different way. The girls, mm -hmm. I stayed in touch with the girls and there's girls that I definitely stay in touch with, but um, the boys are pretty assertive about, a number of them, about wanting to, stay in touch and it's kind of like they, they really want advice. Yeah. 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 And I guess it's it's a form of intimacy in a way to share something and yeah. challenges that you're dealing with. I feel a little bit like Dr. Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well well let's talk just a little bit about your experience as an author, as a writer, as someone who's sharing a lot of ideas because you are you know, you're a best-selling author of many books now, um, but you're also on Twitter, you are on YouTube, you know, you are getting your message out in yeah. different uh, ways. Mm -hmm. You did a TED Talk. Um, how, do you, oh, yeah. how do you find that, um, is this an opportunity, is it an obligation, mm. um, and what is kind of the driving force for you to kind of keep getting your thoughts and your words out in different ways? Well, fundamentally, I am a writer. I mean, that is who I am, that is what I do. And um, for me right now, the books are the, the centerpiece. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also really like writing the Times essays that I've been doing mm -hmm. in the Sunday Review, those are really great. Um, but you kind of have to be, these days, be sort of a brand as well, mm -hmm. um, which is a new thing. Yeah. Um, so if you're not, you, you have to do a certain amount of social media. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm really ambivalent about that. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's an effective way to get our ideas out, but it's, I mean, it is where people are. Yeah. So um, it's really, what the, the difficult thing about it is that it, I feel like all of the social media is very reactive media. 
Okay. So it doesn't encourage a kind of depth of thinking or reflection. It just encourages a bang, bang. I mean, you know, we see that ultimately in our current president, right? I mean, the most reactive human being on the planet. Um, and so it can actually sort of undermine what I need to do in order to do the real work of the writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that I have to actually do things like go to a writer's colony or do something where I forcibly remove myself mm -hmm. from um, the kind of noise and tweeting of today's society in order to really get those deeper ideas out. Mm -hmm. um, but once I've done that and have those ideas out to try to hook people in um, to, to get to that is, is so what all the rest of it is. Kind of yeah. Read your deep thoughts. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, and I'm glad that there's things like the TED Talk or that people can just get the Fresh Air podcast mm -hmm. um, and, and have access to those. I mean, you know, I would love it if they read the book. I would love it if they bought the book. But um, if they even just do that much, I, that's meaningful to me. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. Really My pleasure. enjoyed meeting and talking, talking to you. you. And I look forward to Boys and Sucks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.